So, hello and welcome to the film talk after the film The Dissident. My name is Anna Rams Kublavit and I'm the director of the Human Rights Film Festival Berlin and it's my pleasure to welcome next to me Lina al a uh, Saudi Arabian women and human rights activist. Please give a warm welcome to Lina. Hi there. Um, so some of you might already know Lena from her very touching and emotional, challenging and wonderful speech at our opening night, as Lena is also the sister of our honorary patron, and it's our absolute pleasure having you here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, I think the case Khashoggi is, it shook the world a bit, but not really. It like, there was a short outcry and then it somehow seemed to vanish. Uh, so my first question would be, how is the situation in Saudi Arabia in general today? And how did the murder of Khashoggi influence the situation and did it change anything? Um, I think the, the movie explains it uh, quite well. Um, the situation in Saudi Arabia, the human rights situation in Saudi Arabia is um, a nightmare. It's a very dark era. Um, so um, as it's explained in the, in the, in the movie, um, you know, before Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman came to power, um, it was an absolute monarchy. And of course, it was very difficult for people to... Um, to try to reform things. But as uh, Khashoggi himself says it, um, there was still some kind of a place for reform. And my sister herself was, you know, she's an activist and she's silenced now. But um, she, she has been in prison a couple of, um, of times. Uh, but before 2015, uh, it was a bit different. They still could challenge um, the, 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 the government a bit. Um, but now that Mohammed bin Salman is in power, um, civil society is non-existent. Everyone is silenced, um, either by, um, you know, uh, being behind bars, uh, disappearing, um, killed. And so the only people we can hear now, uh, the independent Saudi voices, are abroad, basically. So, um, yes, it's a very bad era for Saudi Arabia now. Um, so in that sense, you are one of those voices being abroad. Um, and it's, it's, I think, so important that you and others are heard. My question would be, my next one, in your opinion, um, how can we support Saudi activists before we move deeper into the context of the whole film? What could we here do to support you, to show solidarity and to try to support you in building a civil society or pressuring mm -hmm. the government? Yes, so I think it's a very important question because, um, I mean, the, the, there's so much things to, to, to be done and um, everyone who has so much leverage over what can be changed in Saudi Arabia. It's not a hopeless situation, I must say. Um, we, we can change things if, um, if voices are heard. So the, the very first thing is to challenge um, uh, MBS's narrative when it comes to reforms and you know human rights and the women empowerment um, and uh, I mean no one criticizes the crown prince in Saudi Arabia you can you can search as much as you want you will never find anyone who has said anything about the crown prince that is not positive so um, this is the ver very first sign that you should not listen to the people inside of the country um, because there are no independent voices and the only ones that can be critical and know that what really is going on are the Saudis abroad. So I think that, um, uh, again, uh, whenever your governments or, you know, uh, even just for events, I mean, uh, now Saudi Arabia is using um, sports and the concerts and everything and entertainment industry to, to basically whitewash what, what is going on in the country and to be uh, seen um, and to have this image of reformers and open, uh, opening up. So I think that... Um, 
whenever you have your artist going to your favorite artist going to Saudi Arabia, remind them what is going on in um, in the country. Uh, ask about political prisoners. Um, I mean, what saved my sister is really the, the pressure that we. We, we had when about everything, you know, when a company wanted to invest in, in, in Saudi Arabia, we, we just um, were using the same hashtag they were using and just publishing the pictures of my sister. So, you know, it seems like it's um, useless, but at the end it really made a change, you know, um, reminding the people of what is going on in the country and not be uh, fooled or blinded or, you know, blinding yourself or uh, ju just because it's easier. So I think... Um, as it is said now, MBS has no legitimacy, basically. Um, he, uh, he changed the, the path of the, the, the royal family. Um, the royal family um, doesn't as, accept him. He did a coup. The people inside of the country didn't choose him. And the only thing that makes him stay in power is the West accepting him. So if the West uh, speaks up and uh, um, you know, shows that his uh, narratives are false and that um, uh, they're not fooled by uh, the, the, the fake uh, promises, um, then it can change something and our voices can be heard. And I mean, I don't want to be too political, even though it is, as <laughs> Ammar said it in the, in the movie, um, if you don't talk about the royal family, then, you, then uh, you're not political and you can't have any, any, any change. But, uh, so, um, you know, we, we, we have, um, the initiative we had is that we, now that everyone is silenced, we have to be the, the voice of Saudi Arabia. And so we, we gathered uh, in the diaspora um, first, and there we also have people inside of the country. And we created the first uh, political party, which is uh, the National Assembly Party. So I think also encouraging your governments to hear these kind of initiatives and have us in the table of negotiations every time it comes to Saudi, it's uh, important uh, for us. Absolutely. Um, in the film and in the Khashoggi case, it's a lot about cybersecurity. Uh, what role plays cybersecurity for you in the mistreatment and uh, of human rights activists, but also in holding the civil society down? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So maybe I will start by giving my personal experience with it. So um, my sister, Lujain, when she got arrested, before that, um, she, uh, her um, email account was hacked. And she knew it came from the Emirates. And a couple of months later, she was kidnapped from the Emirates and she was brought back to Saudi Arabia. So we really see that governments first target the, the cell phones because that's where they can get the most information from your address, your, where you go, where you know everything you do, uh, even when you know who you, you hang out with. Um, so it's really a danger for activists, for anyone trying to to bring change in the country, but it's also a danger for, as Omar said it, um, for the, the inner circle of these people. I mean, um, so many of Lujain's friends have been targeted, you know, um, and also uh, another um, activist, Yahya Asiri, his phone was uh, hacked and his inner circle as well was uh, um, afterwards um, harassed and, uh, and targeted. So we see that um, it uh, intimidates people, not only for them, because if you think that you're doing the right thing, you might also accept the risk of being targeted. But then when you know that your phone is hacked, then you know that your family and your friends might be targeted as well, which is um, um, a very, um, you know, this is what might uh, silence people more than being uh, just them. So yes, that's from the activist side, but also as it has been said in the movie, the only platform the Saudis have to discuss social and political issues is Twitter. And since Mohammed bin Salman came to power, now you don't have real accounts of people discussion issues, discussing issues. You have, uh, f I mean, fake accounts because they know they might be targeted. But again, even though they have anonymous accounts, they get targeted, they get harassed, and the last wave of arrests of people just tweeting with fake accounts was in May. So um, there are dozens of people who got arrested because they were tweeting. So yes, cybersecurity is, um, I mean, it's one of the most important uh, uh, you know, uh, tools now that they have to, to target um, and to, to silence uh, society. Um. I mean, and a life without a cell phone is unimaginable, isn't it? Also for activists, it's what you use on a daily basis. So they, they, 
you, you can't work without it. Absolutely, yeah, exactly. And in particular, if you have friends and family in the diaspora. Um, so in, in the film, you have, we have spoken about it shortly before, but for me it was, um, when I would imagine the case, I would be like terrified. Um, Khashoggi bent, was lured into an embassy and he was killed there. So what I know from many people who come from repressive regimes is that it's very complicated for them in case, for example, their passports expired if they are in exile. Um, how, I mean, would you ever enter a Saudi embassy? Um, no, I think everyone after the murder of Khashoggi, no one uh, in his uh, right state of mind would do it. Um, but actually, what's funny to know is that even after this story that made you know the that everyone knows about, um, they're still trying to lure some people into embassies. So my own brother, who lives in Canada, um, he wanted to renew his Saudi passport, and um, in the official procedure, it says that he has to send it by uh, mail, and it gets back by, to him by mail. And it took months, so he called them and he said, okay, um, what's happening with my passport, why, why isn't it renewed? And they, they said, ah, because you have to come to the embassy. And then he just said, no, I'm sorry, I cannot come, you know. <laughs> I don't have to give you my, my reasons, but I think you understand. And then they said, um, oh, no, you don't have anything to worry about, uh, just come and, uh, and take it. And then he insisted, he said, no, I'm not coming. And the procedure says that I'm not supposed to come to the embassy physically. And um, you know, then again, that's what tw Twitter is useful for, because it took months, and you know, he recorded all the calls. And uh, at the end, he said, "Okay, I, I, I can, I cannot do anything anymore, and I'm just going to publish the story on Twitter." And he did, and you know, of course, it got retweeted, and people, you know, were commenting, saying, "Okay, the, they're maybe going a bit too far again." And they called him and they said, okay, we're sending your passport to, and it worked. So we see that really Twitter brings a change in, in, in Saudi. I think that's also what we can all see in the campaign you did for your sister or the campaign for your sister, for your sister's release, um, that public pressure and um, targeting them publicly is helping in mm -hmm. a way. Absolutely. Um, in your very personal opinion, what do you think? How could we prevent another hack murder? Is there even the possibility to prevent one? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think uh, now that uh, awareness is here, uh, that you know um, the, the the Pegasus project ha has been published, I don't think uh, we can't say we don't know anymore. We know which companies do it. We know how they do it, and uh, we 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 know how to act. So I think that the European Parliament, by the way, ha is doing a great job. I think um, by trying to monitor and. Uh, um, you know, in the best case scenario, stop the, the selling of uh, these um, spywares to um, regimes that we know will use it for the, the, the bad reasons. So I think that um, it's mainly democratic states, democratic states um, selling it to non-democratic states. So I think that they should have a procedure where they monitor, control um, the, the selling of these spywares and uh, to be sure that um, they're not used uh, for these kind of, uh, of crimes. And I think that the first thing to do for now is really uh, boycott the companies that have been uh, you know, selling it to dictators and uh, who have been um, using it for uh, murders and uh, kidnappings and uh, torture. At the, everything we've been going through. Um, and, and then, you know, if uh, we get a, a better understanding of how this works and, you know, if governments need it, uh, it has to be monitored and the procedure has to be transparent and, you know, the people um, have to vote on how, who and how these um, um, spywares should be used. If, if, they, if they have to be used, in my opinion, they should not exist, but... Uh. In my opinion, it shouldn't exist either. I feel sometimes that we are much further than uh, George Orwell's uh, book ever predicted that we could be surveillance. And I completely agree. I think human rights to diligence should also always play a major part when, uh, as in particular, like when countries export whatever kind of goods to other countries that could harm people in a way. Um, 
let it be weapons or uh, spyware, uh, I would like to look into the audience and ask you if you have any questions, if there are any burning questions from the audience. If so, please, there is a microphone. Uh, use it. That's a very unique opportunity to have uh, Lena here with us. I will give you one more question to think about it while I ask Lena something myself. Um, so we all know that the human rights in situation in Saudi Arabia is bad at all levels, more or less. But I mean, the women rights situation in particular is horrifying. Um, how could Western companies, you, uh, companies, countries, <laughs> European countries, support the women rights movement in Saudi Arabia? And where would be buttons that could be pressed so that women have more rights? For example, um, you were challenging the I forgot the name of the, the system where the, the male guardianship. guardianship. Yeah, yeah yes. that's the name. <laughs> um, I think, you know, again, the pressure is the same when it comes to any right in Saudi Arabia. Um, the thing is, since Mohammed bin Salman came to power, you know, he has this new narrative about, you know, empowering women, giving rights to women, which the previous governments didn't need to do because they were accepted in the West anyway. They didn't have to justify anything. So the, the very difficult thing now is that there are women representing the country that are part of the system that is repressing women still. Um, so, for example, one of them is... Um, Amal al who is now an, ambas an ambassador to Norway. And you know, the, this image of having a Saudi woman as an ambassador, everyone has been applauding it and you know, thinking that she represents the change in the country, which is very tiring for us because now we have to also justify that you know, it's not because she's a woman that, she, you, that you know, the, the situation in Saudi Arabia is better. And this very woman, for example, just for the personal experience is, um, so during my sister's imprisonment, no one was allowed to visit her except my parents. And the only uh, people outside of the family that could visit her and who visited her once or twice was the Human Rights Commission, who, which is an institution that is not independent in Saudi Arabia and that is just used as a tool uh, for the government um, you know, to, to kind of um, legitimate, uh, legitimize its uh, narrative about opening up. So she was part of this Human Rights Commission. She saw my sister. My sister showed her her body. She saw the torture. Uh, she, to she gave her uh, the names of the people who were torturing her, including, uh, so my MBS's right-hand man, Saud al-Ghahtani, was literally torturing my, my sister in prison. And so this woman left and told her, we I can't do anything about uh, what she just told me. And a couple of, a couple of months later, she was um, uh, appointed ambassador to Norway. So we really see that the whole system you know, is, um, is just a farce and lying about what is going on in the country. And um, just to say that um, now the Saudi regime now only cares about its image and how it is seen outside. So uh, how we can help women and uh, is that um, give the voices to the real uh, uh, you know, uh, drivers of change, not the ones who work uh, uh, to, to cover up everything. So including, you know, activists abroad, and even if they're inside the country, if they want to be anonymous, still listen to their stories, trust them. And um, when they tell you that uh, women are freer, do your research, really. So for example, we're say everyone has applauded the fact that women can um, travel without the consent of their male guardian, but no one talks about the disobedience law, which basically vetoes every new freedom that is granted to women. So the male guardian can, can always say that because a woman has um, taken advantage or you know, exercised her freedom, it's disobedient him, so she can get arrested for this. So um, yes, so the, the system is still the same. The found I'm, I'm, I'm not very familiar okay. with Saudi law. <laughs> sorry. This, sorry. I, I know a little bit about the women's rights situation, not, not very deep in. 
So the disobedient law says that basically you as a woman can't say anything against your male guardian? Did I yes, so basic, that? yes. What? So it's not um, written explicitly what this disobedience law. Uh, it's uh, used as, as anyone, you know, um, wants. So if a, 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 the male guardian, so your father, your husband, or sometimes your son, if he, um, in his own world and in, in his own thinking, he thinks that you have been doing that something that is uh, disobedient him, then he can, yes, get you arrested for this. So even if you now have this new, tra just, just to make yes. it very clear and understandable, so even if women could possibly decide to travel without like having the uh, yes by their male guardian, uh, if they do it and they don't have the yes, uh, they can it can be brought charges of, of them with the disobedient law, so it, it like completely falls off. Yes, so it's basically just removing a procedural uh, step for women, you know, so the privileged women who, like myself, honestly, you know, uh, it's just easier for us to, to travel now because we don't have to have the, uh, the, the consent before traveling, you know, so now I, can, I could travel without my dad having to sign a paper, etc. But for the ones who, you know, would like to travel if they come back and their male guardian is uh, really mad about it, of course they can do something about it. I think it's very important that we keep those details in mind and if we see that somebody changes on the surface, really look also as a European audience deeper into it and do our research before we form an opinion. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Thank Lina. You. It was a pleasure talking to you as always. You. I Thank everyone in the audience that they joined us so late today uh, for our last screening on this wonderful Sunday. I hope everyone has a great start into the new week on Monday. And I hope to see you back at the festival on or offline soon. Thank you so much.